cause the movement of the foreign body and cause more damage and those are inconclusive also but most important as in this case is the electrical conduction which is identified which is called as a metallonoscope which is small and portable so this is how it would work the sound can i have the sound i just replay it again because the uh, i'm not even sound? near it and it's picking it up so as you can see this is the metalloscope which is identifying where the metal is so this is a similar kind which is called as a berman locator which was been used before so th this same technology is used right now to identify metals superficially this is one more kind which is called as roper hall these are all different technologies which were available before and right now have been used in different cases as you can see this is a wood so it can identify a non metallic foreign body also which gives an identification where exactly it is and we can change over and switch the mode to metal and then identify where it is so these are all uh, historical importances but yes there are uh, certain uses sometimes X-rays right now not much, but if you have an X-ray, anterolateral and uh, sorry, lateral and uh, PA view is more important. In X-rays, how would you identify? Is the direct method method depending on the so this is the direct method where you uh, ask the patient to wear a contact lens which is having a lead pellets in it and then to identify it. But it all depends upon assumptions that the actual lens is 24, the corneal diameter is this. Still, you would miss it. As in this case, you could understand that this is somewhere extraocular, so it is just near the edge of the uh, uh, orbit as you can see. So this was a pellet which was just uh, into the orbit rather than in the uh, intraocular. Other methods where you ask the patient to move the eyes up, down and straight gaze and then you take again the assumptions are there. Most important the sweets method uh, if there is any postgraduate we have to understand that what the sweets method is because this is more important. We have two metallic uh, identification marks where they have marked and then you take an x-ray and then you identify whether this is within the eye or outside the eye. As in this case, this is uh, corresponding to outside the eye where the foreign body is over there. And then you can take another something which is called a stereoscopic photograph, not very common. Delineation of the eye, there is some kind of an injection in the tenon space which you can do and then do it, not frequently followed. Limbal ring is more common, that is also a history, but yes, sometimes that can be used. Contact lens. This is also not used a bone uh, free material. Ultrasonography is more important as in this case you can see uh, reverberations which you are seeing are more so because of the metallic foreign body and the, if the reverberations are not much it can be something less which is a glass or a, some kind of a rock over there and but you can see this is very highly reflective. There can be other things like vitreous hemorrhage, end of thalmitis or either CDs with vitreous hemorrhage, RD and sometimes a very gross pan of thalmitis where you can see a T sign also. Problems in B scans are the font bodies can be missed, integrity of the eyeball if not correct we should not perform, air bubbles can be confused, organic matters are difficult to identify, UBM as in this case you can see this is a x-ray which is showing the font body is in the eye, patient is having a PL negative vision but as in the B scan you are not able to identify because eye is very soft, it is a pre -thysical. we did a B scan and yes you, uh, a UBM where you can see a foreign body is very anterior, CT scan can be used as in this case you can see a foreign body and an air bubble. Sometimes it can be at the edge of the foreign body, we can ask them to decrease the contrast so that we have a little better uh, understanding of the uh, edges of the globe to understand whether it's in the eye or outside the eye. Over this, there are multiple foreign bodies in the left eye, right eye. B-scan is also showing a high reflective material which is in the eye, as you can see, very low. But this is the metallic, this is non-metallic one. Metallic foreign bodies again. Glass foreign bodies, sometimes we can ask them to have a three-dimensional uh, uh, approach. This was a case which was having a sidrosis, complicated cataract and foreign body was in the inferior part which we had removed, ERG showed negative. So some cases even the ERG can also help you to identify cases. This was a rare case in which there was a small cannula which was there in operating cannula. So uh, this was a rare of rare case which you can have uh, in which most important is to see that whether it's an inferior temporal where we keep the infusion. And MR or MRI is usually should be avoided because if it's metallic it would cause more problems and plastic or wound foreign bodies are very rare. So the take home message would be a detailed ocular adenexial examination or a visual recording. Most important is to counsel the patient what he has, what we want to treat and what the visual potential would be. Eye shield and patch should be applied and imaging if the globe is formed B scan can be done. If not, if the uh, globe is deformed, a primary repair X-ray if patient is affording CT scan can be done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Divyansh. I think we'll have the questions towards the end if in case we have time. So to summarize what Dr. Divyansh said, we have to have a classification system so that we all speak in the same language. So that like if somebody says zone one, zone two, we understand what is the se severity of the disease. 
And also as far as investigations are concerned, the clinical examination, the indirect ophthalmoscopy, straight lamp examination is important. More importantly, what we do is an ultrasound, a careful ultrasound without pressing on the eye. And subsequently, X-ray is something which we don't very often do now. A CT scan, and if it is a non-metallic foreign body, a CT, uh, an MRI would tell us where the foreign body is and help us plan it. Next, I call upon Dr. Saronan. He'll be speaking to us about when we should time the post-segment intervention in a patient with open globe trauma. Th thank you, sir. So, as an introduction, we know that uh, men are more prone to get injured, more so in the younger age group. And uh, critical is to identify what, uh, what type of trauma, penetrating, blunt, whether we have a foreign body inside, whether there's an infection, whether there's an attachment. So all these will uh, uh, help you to maximize your uh, visual outcome. And also, it will also decide uh, when to intervene. So blunt trauma, we mainly uh, deal in eyes where there is no comp compromise of the globe integrity. And in these cases, uh, usually we mainly look at uh, treatable lesions will include a tear or a dialysis. Uh, and uh, when there is a retinal detachment, we will have to look from the periphery. So any blunt trauma, make sure that you have to do a scrilal depression. So, 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 sometimes it may look like innocuous trauma. I had a, a injury with a, a rubber ball or I was just walking down the steps of a uh, bus and somebody hit to the elbow. So even in a, 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 a trivial blunt trauma, always make sure that you do a proper dilate, dilated fundus examination with scrilal depression because dialysis can be easily missed when we don't do a scrilal depression. And these eyes have to be, uh, in case the patient has got a very severe uh, swelling or high fema or any cause for vision, I mean, uh, visualization of the fundus is difficult, you can always wait for a few days, a week or 10 days, and then call them back again to examine the fundus. So this is one of our cases where we had a, a blunt trauma. You can see that vitreous base avulsion. So vitreous base avulsion may not always indicate the presence of a peripheral retinal dialysis. And usually you have to search for these most commonly in the supernasal as well as the infrotemporal quadrant, which is one of the most predominantly involved quadrants. You can get in other quadrants as well, but at least you have to screen for the presence of dialysis in the supranasal as well as the infrotemporal quadrant. So by default, like vitreous base avulsion is there, you have a strong suspicion of, a, not always, but you have a strong suspicion of retinal dialysis. The next picture shows the uh, same eye after uh, uh, the uh, scleral buckling where he had a peripheral retinal dialysis with a localized R, which is not shown in the picture. It was a routine fundus program, we could not access it, but you can see that there's a small buckle effect seen and the uh, presence of the vitreous base avulsion. So when you have a, a blunt trauma with a macular hole, macular hole per se is not a, a urgent indication where you should go for urgent vitrectomy. A lot of times we tend to observe these patients and a considerable percentage of uh, macular holes close in the first two to three months or four months. We usually wait for at least three months or four months before we try to intervene for a macular hole surgery. But contra contrary to that, if you have a macular tear, so when there's a, especially a very strong blunt trauma, sometimes in the young patient where the vitreous is broadly attached at the macula, a macular tear is always an urgent indication for vitrectomy because these patients, even with vitrectomy, tend to do poorly and a lot of times you end up with a recurrent retinal attachment and vision loss. So macular hole, you can always wait, at least wait for three months till to see if it spontaneously resolves or closes. The serial uh, monitoring with OCT to see how, whether size is increasing or decreasing will help you to make a decision. But mac macular tears never wait, go for immediate surgery. One more common thing which you see is uh, 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 Valsalva retinopathy. Uh, so mainly in Valsalva retinopathy, not always we do uh, YAG hyalurotomy or hy uh, YAG ILMotomy, whatever you want to call it. We try to open up the uh, blood and drain it into the uh, vitreous cavity. So you have immediate uh, visual, visual rehabilitation. But uh, how to decide? Right? Not all patients end up with a poor visual outcome. So you have in the left side, you have one, pe one person who had developed uh, Valsalva but resolved without any consequences normal phobia now next you have a degenerated macula so what decides which patient will go for a degenerate which which patients with valsalva should go for a uh, laser uh, opening up of the uh, uh, sub ilm space so mainly you concentrate on this point where the ilm attaches to the retina so you look at the difference between these two when there is a no drag on the retina that means because the blood itself is not that very toxic, like the subretinal hemorrhage, here it's in the preretinal space. So mainly what uh, decides whether the macula degenerates or not is the pressure within the uh, cavity, in the sub-ILM cavity. How much blood is there, how much pressure it is causing. When the pressure is too much, you see the retina is getting dragged up like this. So when, there, when you have a drag of the retina, that means the pressure is considerable and these patients need to be decompressed. Either you can do a YAG laser, but if you feel the blood is already clotted, then you can take them off for surgery, open up this ILM uh, uh, membrane over the macula and try to drain or aspirate the blood. So when you have this finding, 
do something immediately laser if possible if not surgery if it is like this then you are uh, happy to wait and watch so that you don't you don't end, end up like such consequences so timing of uh, in, uh, intervention in a uh, in a compromised globe where there's a, either an intraocular foreign body or a penetrating trauma will be decided by all these findings when there's an infection which dr mahesh anum sir will be talking on in, in the next talk so that is going to be a very urgent indication for either doing an intravital uh, vitreous tap or intravital injection or like most of the cases are very poor prognosis better to go for media clearing vitrectomy and intravital uh, uh, injections of antibiotics the presence of intraocular foreign body also especially if we don't know what type of foreign body is inside the eye so if you are sure that it's a glass or if it's a uh, non reactive uh, like a diamond like we have a case where diamonds and gold pieces have been uh, found inside the eye uh, we had a patient where we had a gold uh, chain which a uh, piece of a gold chain which was inside the eye and we have uh, cases from uh, surat where uh, uh, diamond merchants so they are sort of inert objects where you are sure stone pieces are there like when you have a blast injury so when you are sure like what type of foreign body is inside and you feel, know that it is an inert foreign body you may time your surgery according to your wish to allow the anterior wounds to heal and then go inside but if you don't know what type if it is like a copper or a crude iron where the cirrhosis and the chalcosis can be a issue then always what type of foreign body if you don't know or if you are sure it is a highly reactive foreign body better to intervene and immediately remove it and also the presence of retinal detachment Uh, and then uh, so if you if you if you have if there's no other urgent indication we always give some time for the anterior open wounds to the primary repair which we do the either the corneal tear or corneal scleral tear you allow it to wound uh, wound to heal a little bit but always a lot of times during vitrectomy all these pores tend to leak and cause a lot of issues and makes a, a surgery much more difficult one more indication is uh, glaucoma mainly go cell glaucoma where the capsule is compromised and all these cells come and clog the uh, trabecular meshwork in these eyes uh, they are intractable to treatment with the routine medication so you may have to go inside and clear up the vitreous cavity just washing the anterior chamber is not going to help because all the cells are coming from the posterior segment so you have to do a nice uh, uh, vitreous uh, lavage and vitreous base shaving because all the leftover vitreous skirt will uh, capture a lot of cells and uh, keep on releasing it so if you don't do a proper vitreous base shaving in the immediate post op the ghost cells can get released from the skirt and then um, Uh, lead to secondary again recurrence of the glaucoma so this is a patient where there was a retinal detachment with the panophthalmitis uh, secondary to a blast injury with retinal detachment other eye was totally thysical so we could not wait uh, till the, all the cornea cleared so we have to go in uh, the cornea is still uh, cellular infiltrate is there but because of the presence of rd and this being the only seeing eye we had to go for a keratoprosthesis so this may sometimes be warranted when you want to intervene early when the anterior segment is still not fully healed so we are keeping a temporary k pro there Uh, to suturing it and then going going into the vitreous surgery unfortunately he had lot of uh, this is a uh, pseudomonas infection inside and you can see the extensive extrudes uh, the posterior pole was fairly okay but uh, he could get gain only hand movements vision he could not get any better than that those are the stone particles which you are seeing there because of the blast injury which were removed through the anterior root after being grasped by the forceps and foreign body will be dealt by uh, um, rajesh later on so uh, one of the other common indication of an intervention is vitreous hemorrhage so vitreous hemorrhage per se is not an urgent indicator but uh, if 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 you are uh, sure that's only you do ultrasound and assess the uh, uh, structure of the retina there's, there's no retinal detachment only vitreous hemorrhage probably you can wait and watch whether to see spontaneous resolution or if there's retinal detachment or if there is a presence of a foreign body then you may want to intervene much more earlier and also the secondary glaucoma also is a indicator so when doing vitrectomy in these eyes make sure that you uh, go about uh, the initial steps much more slowly because here you have vitreous hemorrhage we are not sure what is lying underneath ultrasound can give only a sort of a, a, a teaser we don't know exact status of the retina and whether how mobile it is or this retinal detachment sometimes you can mistake the presence of a retinal detachment in ultrasound you can you may miss a, a retinal detachment so you always go about slowly till you get a final view of the retina and then then you can be a little bit more vigorous and ag- aggressive and treating that once you see the retina and you know what are the additions then you can be a little bit more comfortable in operating for example in this case you can see there's a total retinal incarceration and what we thought was uh, rd was actually a exposed uh, sub rp so the retina totally is Uh, uh, from this, all these areas, retina is torn and uncut in the t- temporal scleral wound, and what you see is the bare uh, RP rather than the retina. So there is not a, a, t- a total uh, retinal detachment with the I- incarceration the other side. So we are, if we don't realize this, then you may not, you may make mistakes during the surgery. 
So when you're approaching these things like this, uh, you have to, I was talking about giving some time for the wounds to heal. In this case, once you see that this is a recently operated scleral wound where there was a retinal detachment. But once we put on put in our ports, you can see that a wound is starting to leak. So if you have a person who's working with you, you always ask the anti segment surgeon to be a little bit more aggressive in their closure. A lot of times, especially the corneal surgeons, they go for more of uh, beauty I mean, the, the, to maintain the globe uh, convexity and uh, shape rather than going for a watertight wound. So if you plan for an immediate uh, post uh, primary wound repair, if you are going to plan for immediate intervention of the posterior segment, always ask your anterior segment surgeon to go for a more watertight wound rather than just maintaining the contour of the globe. So uh, then next time, so what, what type of surgery to use? Uh, some people still prefer the 20 uh, guard surgery when, when, involved, when operating on these eyes with severe uh, uh, trauma, but uh, it's not so. We can still do a decent job with the MIVS surgery. So if there are large clots, sometimes the clots can get uh, clog your uh, vitrector, so you may want to go with the 20 or 23 guards. But if they are uh, just a liquid blood, uh, 23, uh, 20, 25 will, uh, will do. So if there's only a retinal attachment of the peripheral retinal dialysis uh, is always uh, just enough to do a scleral buckle, especially in a, where the globe uh, integrity is not compromised. But uh, uh, so one of the things we'll have to keep watch is when there's extensive Berlin sedima when you're doing vitrectomy, the, retina, the vitreous can be very adherent to the vitreous and peeling them during the surgery, in interoperative vitrectomy surgery will be very difficult. And also when there is a sutured scleral wound, placement of buckle may be uh, difficult because of the additions between the sclera and the muscles and sclera and the conjunctiva also. So when you're making your ports to main, especially immediately after surgery, make sure that you don't uh, in, in, uh, induce too much pressure in, inside the globe. Otherwise, it'll cause opening up of the uh, uh, recently operated wound. So what you do is you do a s small slight uh, sideward uh, movement of the blade so that it makes the uh, pass passage of the cannula easier. Otherwise, when you put too much pressure, it can uh, increase the globe pressure and uh, allow the uh, recently operated wounds to open. When you're making your ports, where to place your ports uh, depends upon your visibility as well as the uh, pathology in, which is inside. Suppose you have a very op opaque cornea or whether there's a lens, a damage to the lens, then you know, when you put a port, you don't know whether it's going in the supracordial space or a subretinal space, then you want to keep it in the anterior chamber. If you're sure what, what, what is inside, then you can still go ahead with the, uh, uh, this thing. So I, I also prefer to use walled cannulas, especially when you're washing blood, because when you're operating on these wounds, it takes a long time and that indeed it's a lot of wastage of the uh, BSS. So I sometimes prefer to use walled cannulas in these size. And also when you're not sure of the uh, position of the retina, you can always use a six millimeter cannula so that there's a lesser chance of placing the subretinal, sub infusion in the subretinal space or the supracordial space. Here you can see that this eye where, because of the damage to the lens, we don't know where the infusion will end up. So we are going to put this in the anterior chamber and then we can do a lensectomy or as I say, whichever is uh, convenient to you. So also when you are operating on these wounds, what, what you have to keep in mind is that uh, the visibility is either poor because of the extensive damage to the cornea or the lens and uh, peeling the epithelium will most of the times help in these eyes. And if it's very, very poorly damaged, then you may have to go for a temporary cut-up process. So here you can see that the lens is cataracted and I'm trying to remove the lens with a lensectomy and that thereby uh, making the media more clear and making it easier for us to access. So retinal attachment, I think Dr. Lingam sir will be covering in the uh, last talk. So, so this is one of the cases where there was a total retinal attachment with a GRT with a cauliflower retina where the retina is totally cut off from the peripheral uh, vitreous I mean, in insertion. And then we have to release, uh, use, release it using a bimodal technique because it's very difficult to deal with these eyes. So one of the things which you have to keep in mind is uh, post-operative hypotony, uh, which can be a real problem, especially in severely traumatized eyes. So you always make sure that there's no leaking wound, which can be the primary cause to rule out and try to suture them properly. And then you can have a transient ciliary body shock, which can recover with the steroids. Or there can be presence of a cycle dialysis cleft, which can be, should be either treated with a cryopexy or if that doesn't work with a belt buckle. Uh, or when there is extensive damage to the ciliary body and atrophy that leads to complete and uh, permanent hypotony where you may have to leave the oil uh, inside permanently because once you remove the oil there is no proper ciliary, uh, I mean echo secretion of the ciliary body leading to hyp uh, hypotony and finally thysis. So in these eyes where the uh, ciliary body is permanently damaged, severely damaged, we want to leave the uh, oil inside indefinitely to maintain the globe architecture and uh, not allow it to uh, become thysical. 
So in patients with extensive trauma, especially following a post-trauma uh, post infection, there's a chance of developing a thick uh, cyclic membrane just behind the lens involving the ciliary body area. So if it's very extensive, there's not much we can do. Even if you cut it, it's going to reform again because just a scarring process. But if it's a very thin membrane, you can dissect it using through the anterior, uh, by viewing through the microscope without any viewing system and try to dissect that, thereby trying to uh, allow the ciliary body to uh, uh, get back its function and then uh, uh, so that it hypertonia will be uh, uh, this thing. This is one more case where again there's a lot of glass foreign body sending for a ro road traffic accident just to show that the use of keratoprosthesis this is not very expensive. Uh, the uh, foreign uh, keratoprosthesis cost you around 20,000 20, to 30,000 rupees. The Indian one costs hardly five to 6,000 rupees. Madhu instruments make them. So it's, uh, uh, post segment surgeons should not hesitate to use these in, in eyes where there is severe compromise of the anterior segment and visibility is very poor. And all these eyes will need a long-term steroid therapy, especially when the eye is severely traumatized. And this may also sometimes uh, will salvage your surgery. A lot of times you do a very good surgery and you don't follow it up with proper steroid therapy. It's going to end up in serious complications. So make sure that you treat them uh, adequately with steroids. And sometimes it may carry on for a few months also. So make sure that you do that also to salvage, to increase your success rate in these eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saronan. If I can uh, summarize Dr. Saronan's uh, talk. So wound repair has to be immediate. And when we do it, you have to intervene early. That's uh, early vitrectomy would be in the presence of a retinal detachment, intraocular foreign body, and endophthalmitis. So I have a question to Dr. Saronan. If in case uh, you remove the gold foreign body or diamond foreign body, do you get to keep it or you have to give it to the patient? Gold, we had to give it back, but I, uh, one of the presenters in VRS say he would, uh, was from Surat. Kaushal Bowser. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he was retaining the foreign body, and the factory owner was always fighting him to give back the diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions or comments to Dr. Saronan or to Dr. Divyansh? Okay, we'll go on to the next topic, which is uh, Dr. Rajesh will be speaking to us on intraocular foreign body management. Thank you, sir one of the most important uh, aspects as well as an interest for the VR surgeon. Can you please join us on the guys? So I'll be dealing with the retained intraocular foreign body. I'll go uh, a, s a few cases as such, not the entire gamut of uh, cases because of shortage of time. So the anteriorly placed uh, foreign bodies are much, much more easier. On the left side, we have corneal foreign, foreign body over here. And there is an um, anterior chamber located in the anterior chamber. These are very easy to identify, as well as retrieval also is much, much more easier. The more difficult ones are the posterior segment ones. The approach is a little bit tricky and different. What we anticipate and what we end up is a little bit of a different. Most of the times, it might um, you know, go on in the way that we had planned, but sometimes it may not. This is just a cannula which Divyansh had already shown, which was retained over there. The outer part of the cannula has been ripped off, and the inner part of the cannula is still retained over there. This is a post vitrectomy. Obviously, those cannulas were placed to do a primary vitrectomy for a different uh, scenario, and this acts as a retained foreign body right now. So though retrieval is, you know, very much easier over here, sometimes it might be very much hidden or, you know, completely encapsulated and fibrous with vascularization because it's very close to the pass plana and, foreign and uh, ciliary body. Retrieval might be very, very difficult with huge amount of bleeding, dialysis, aerodialysis, cyclodialysis might also occur. Sometimes we are... Sometimes we might come across a uh, penetrating foreign body, which might go up to the extent of uh, the muscle insertion. So it might cut through it. So suturing it or enforcing the already sutured primary wound. Since an ultrasound was also done, this was a, a large for granite piece, which was located inside. He was a stone cutter. So primary approach was through retrieval of the foreign body through the anterior segment. So a scleral tunnel was placed and entry and then uh, gingerly removing all the vitreous adents around the foreign body to make it free. Once that is done, enlarging the port, the scleral tunnel uh, port, and then 
using a long prong Mekima forceps to retrieve it back. Tilt it into the anterior chamber. And removing it. The posterior uh, uh, macula and the retina should be well guarded either with PFCL or the cushion even before we induce the PVD should be left behind to act as a cushion in case if these foreign body tends to drop behind. We had had instances where the foreign bodies have multiple slippages and fall back and causing trauma which was not present previously. So there are others, uh, the anterior foreign body which uh, this was or much much more easier not much of a difficulty. When we look into the posterior segment, there's only vitreous hemorrhage, there's no retinal issues as such. So the PVD induction and the um, continuation of surgery is as usual. There are other uh, case scenarios where the foreign body is gone through the lens and it precludes our visibility. So first and foremost is we don't have an option other than removing the lens, doing a lensectomy or a cataract surgery if the lens is quite hard. Once that is done, once we'll go inside, there's organized vitreous hemorrhage with the foreign body. As Dr. Sarun had already mentioned, when this is a scenario, we don't know where is the retina, which is the organized blood. So playing safe, trying to trim as much as possible, debulk the vitreous as minimal as possible, try to locate the foreign body, and then try to retrieve it out. Once the foreign body is out, then we can try to induce a PVD in a localized segment and then continue it all through the posterior pole. Again, since the uh, lens was already removed, this could have been very much retrieved through the uh, pass planar, but since the lens was already re uh, removed, there was a free access through the anterior segment itself. Now the usual continuation with the debulking of the vitreous, creating a cleavage plane between the posterior hyoid and the retina, and then going around to complete the vitreous. All these cases didn't have much of a complication as far as retina was concerned. The retina was well in its place. So we come across other situations where we heard about the ritualette where the primary location of the bo foreign body, it would have hit the retina and then it would have bounced back to be placed at a different area. In this case, there was a huge amount of a clot at a posterior pole just below the uh, disc and you could see over there. We primarily thought that the foreign body is located in this area itself. But once we de um, you know, debulked, we couldn't dissect it further, so we used a bimanual, we put a chandler system and tried to dissect the clot further. To our surprise, there was no foreign body located. It was a large clot which was, you know, at the retinal level and below the retina also. And there was a retinal detachment with a large break over there, but there was no sight of foreign body. So this, L, I mean, since there was no foreign body and we were sure on ultrasound and every other place where the foreign body was located, so we went and searched into the periphery where we could localize in the infrotemporal. So the site of entry was through the middle of the cornea, went and hit the uh, near inferior to the disc and retreated to the infrotemporal site. So again, a metallic foreign body, which was retrieved using a handshake technique, a magnet was introduced pulled up, then used the handshake technique to remove the foreign body. So since there was a retinal detachment, you need to take care, do an air fluid exchange. The PVD was already induced. The clot was already dissected. So we do an air fluid exchange, laser that area, and put in silicon oil. So seemingly simple cases might turn out to be much complex. This is one of our uh, cases where the foreign body had entered in through the infrared temple. You could see the primary uh, sutures which has been placed over here. And inside there, it had broken into two pieces. One was just lying in the anterior vitreous. You could see that I'm using a magnet and a handshake technique to remove it. The patient is still having a clear lens. The pre-op vision was about 660 because of the vitreous hemorrhage rather than any other reason. So once we retrieved it, we went in to retrieve the other one which was penetrating through the, uh, the posterior pole, just lateral to the, about one and a half disc diameter, lateral to the ma macula. Induction of the PVD, all around the foreign, from the disc and then all around the foreign body. So in the case of eventuality, we need to close it. A PVD induction would be much better. So completed the PVD induction. And once it's done, then we um, put a PFCL because there was no retinal detachment. Once you remove the red, uh, this uh, foreign body, there are chances of bleeding and others which might trickle down to the macula. 
So put a PFCL, but once we removed this foreign body, what happened was this PFCL and the fluid and the saline was trickling through it and going into the posterior pole, uh, through it into the retrobulbar space into the orbit. I'll just demonstrate that. So you can see that small amount of trickling of the fluid and that was causing a retrobulbar pressure and causing a choral detachment. So in these conditions where you would have explained to the patient that things are okay, it's just a you know a simple clean surgery where you would do, it turned out to be a much more complicated than we asked for. We, I tried to do an external approach to try to tamponade that uh, area but I couldn't. Then went inside and then used visco and all the other you know, available techniques to tamponade or block this area, which couldn't. Then used uh, you know, a bone wax or an ab gel, which is called, and tried to shove it into this um, break, enclosing and closing the break completely, lasered it and put in silicone oil. This patient did well for a fortunate, and uh, the ab gel didn't do any kind of a reaction intraocularly. So what we anticipated and started, when to start with the case was much more better, but we ended up with a different condition. So any foreign body as such, we shouldn't tackle it saying that, you know, they always keep saying that enemies don't think your enemy is weak. The same way, it's better to be ready for all kinds of eventualities. There are other foreign bodies which might complicate. What I mean by complication is sleeving the retina and causing a, a large retinal tear or a retinal necrosis because of the closure of the, you know, um, branch retinal artery occlusion or a central retinal artery occlusion. This is a, a person who, who was a stone cutter but the, for his uh, misfortune, the entire blade, a part of the blade of the uh, cutter had uh, sleeved through the cornea and into the eye and it had completely torn the inferior retina. So, uh, I mean, trying to, you know, dislodge it from the impacted site and got it into the anterior segment, you could see the magnitude of it. I am using a um, wire vectors to retrieve it out. And despite the largest amount of tunnel, the tunnel which I had made was approximately about 12 to 13 mm, but despite that, it was not coming out. After repeated attempts, we could successfully take it out. So at this point of a time, I, I, I know, asked myself, was it any worth to do uh, such a, a case, but the retina attached and things, and at that point of time, I was very much confident that this patient will go into thysis, but uh, for a surprise, the patient is still maintaining a 3 by 60 vision with oil inside. Obviously, the ciliary body had shut down, and it's not functioning, but he had to need multiple oil exchanges, but the oil is still retaining with a 3 by 60 vision. So what the previous case was much simpler to begin with, ended up at a bit of a complicated situation, but here we thought that the eye was already lost, but we went into having an ambulatory vision. There are other tricky situations. You do a CT scan, the CT scan says that the foreign bodies, I mean, because of the dense you know, um, glow which it gives, so you cannot really I exactly isolate the foreign body, whether it's inside or in the courts or outside. So we thought like it's inside the eye, and then we went ahead with the uh, vitrectomy process. So PVD induction, there was a nasal um, area of trauma. There was no retinal detachment even in this lady. So after the PVD induction, I'm sitting and searching that area. Where is the, the foreign body? I have to retry because I've already counseled the patient that the patient has a foreign body inside. And mind you, even if you don't want or the foreign body is outside, the patient will start asking you once you finish the surgery that where is my foreign body inside? I want it, I have to see it. So I'm trying with a you know, magnet also to see whether it's lodged a little bit deeper into the scleral tissue. I couldn't. So I finished up the surgery by doing a laser, intraocular surgery I mean, by doing laser, doing an air fluid exchange since there was a large break and I had extended it a little bit further. Then since the CT scan and the ultrasound was beyond doubt there was a large foreign body, so I thought like I'll go and externally and find it out. Though this, this is a surgeon to surgeon thing because it's outside the eye, though it is a metallic foreign body, you might leave it. And since it's very posterior, near to the disc, there is a chance that you might 
cause injury to the optic nerve causing an NPL vision also. So looking into the discretion, seeing whether it is really approachable or not, a need, a need basis has to be decided on the table and whether we go chase behind the foreign body to remove it need to be decided upon. But for our luck and the patient's luck, the foreign body could be retrieved. So in s what I mean by devastating is where the entire globe or thing is totally you know, shattered. There's a large foreign body is an auto driver where he had met it with a uh, road traffic accident and the entire, you know, the, uh, the window plane or the glass in a vehicles are much different as compared to the others. It shatters in bulks. So the large chunk of glass had gone inside his eye, completely damaging the ocular structures. So basically we did what we call as a quadruple surgery. Dr. Divyansh was sitting and trying to you know, maneuver and lift it up, but it was too very bulky and he couldn't. So we did a quadruple where I was sitting and trying to hold up the, uh, you know, using two instruments to lift up the foreign body. At the same time, he was trying to you know, create that scleral tunnel and retrieve it out. So it was basically a quadruple surgery. And even in this, if you look at it, of, of you're wondering what this patient might have achieved because he had a bilateral trauma and this was the eye which was better he still maintains 3 by 60 or 2 by 60 vision, ambulatory vision. So it was a bit of gratifying at the end of the day that we took up this case, despite having all kinds of atrocities. So if you ask me the question which and when to be removed, if it's which, then all magnetic metallic bodies such as iron or irritative non-magnetic metallic bodies such as copper, aluminum should be removed. Non-metallic bodies which are irritative such as spore and talc and all organic that is animal and vegetative matter have to be removed. When earlier the done, it's better. But as Dr. Savannah had discussed in detail, time the surgery based on various situations and that has to be taken. But even in late cases, worth an attempt because I had shown some devastating injuries or cases where it was, even Divyan showed a case where it was cirrhosis were quite late. Even in those patients, we did a surgery and it gives some amount of gratifying results. Any pre-operative assess, whichever Divyansh has told, it's not a complete and it's not universally applicable to every patient. So on each case-to-case -case basis, we need to apply it. And to better explain the patient that what is the prognosis, be realistic and then try an attempt. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rajesh. Are there any questions to Dr. Rajesh? Is there any comments, Dr. Saranan? Like, well, like in the previous last uh, last two two or three cases, before you were trying to induce the PVD before identifying the foreign body, uh, which you one, sir? You that the where you the foreign body is behind the globe. The foreign body, which um, Richard attended, had retro gone retro into retro 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 space. Yes, sir. So, like, uh, no, uh, like normally, the, uh, most of the times, uh, what I do is I try to prevent uh, induction of PVD so that uh, in case the foreign body falls down. It may provide a what sort of a cushion in case it tends Sir, to Sir, I fall. do a little bit of a different. I do a rule of thumb where if at all the foreign body is a metallic and a smaller one, I know that it may not cause much harm or I can put a bubble of PFCL and then go ahead with it. And second, with my previous experience where it was lost into the, you know, the eye and the walls. And then I, if I couldn't induce the PVD, if I had removed it, then it would have caused, it was causing a coral detachment over there. And at that point of time, inducing a PVD will be very, very difficult. So my general room of thumb, what I feel a little bit safe is, if it's a smaller one, if it's a metallic, I would definitely be more comfortable inducing the PVD and then going ahead with it. Because the slippage, I can put a small amount of PFCL and then leave it as such. If it's a very large foreign body, I would definitely go ahead, hunt that, remove that first, and then go ahead with the PVD induction. The second one, which I was telling that when you are expecting a thrown through wound, this vitreous will act like a plug there. So when inducing PVD, this may strip off and then cause uh, the retro uh, bulbar passage That's of whatever so. uh, intraocular contents. That is what happened in the other case. Yeah. Sir. Uh, uh, I will just one comment. Thank you. So uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, uh, carbon Rajesh uh, never uh, acts, can act as a cushion for a foreign body. Uh, second, I want to share my experience about 30 to 40 cases of pellet removal because since this was not covered here, and it could not be covered here because pellets are very unique, small, smooth, non-magnetic made pellets. And uh, my experience in Srinagar uh, led me to one fine day because it was impossible. There were now Manish Papa has uh, come up with an instrument for specific for that foreign body. But at that time in 2010, when I started removing those foreign bodies, uh, I just by chance came upon an idea, in fact it was my assistant's idea, 
the smaller end of a calcium scoop and just you know as if you are uh, sucking the pulp take in and, and remove it sir just wanted to share my experience sure thank, thank you there's one question there <coughs> actually in few of the cases the exact localization means uh, uh, do you suggest that in all cases means if you are not able to visualize the foreign body we should do a perfect ct scan sub millimeter scans to localize the foreign body because the approach becomes different some are Totally agree, sir. If you have yeah. the, you know, there are so very limitations. Like whether you, the patient, can afford it, you can definitely go back to the, you know, the radiologist and ask him to decrease the intensity and try to localize it a little bit better. Though it is a much better, but he cannot give an exact localization. You can do it, and if it's a non-metallic body, if a patient can afford, then yes, you can do a MRI also in a few selected, very few cases. So these are the various ways. But whether you have the time. the limitations is not there patient is affordable all those things have to be taken into consideration but if you have an exact localization yes it's definitely much much preferable as compared to not having a exact localization for several reasons the most important is to save your skin because you go inside you don't get a foreign body then you say you patient that it's sorry then he will he might go into medical legal you know cases and other issues also so if you can exactly localize very much nothing like that as compared to not localizing and blindly going in Uh, having said that a foreign body which is transgressing the coat so the eye even from a scan you are never sure whether it is easily approachable from inside oh, or outside sure. or it is part in part towards impossible to say yes, there's another problem and when you talk about intra orbital foreign body like uh, which has gone outside the eye we are trying to remove it from outside a few things we should understand that we don't expect that the foreign body will sit there as a foreign body in front of us it's going to be cocooned by a granulation tissue and it's, it occurs in a matter of hours be a foreign body which is 24 hours old will be covered by some kind of a inflammatory membrane so it won't be visible as a metallic structure so you must actually try to dissect it out and using a magnet to try and find it out is also a good technique and dissecting an extraocular muscle is a very easy way of approaching very posteriorly without too much of a difficulty thank you sir uh, i have just Elaborate means uh, if there is very anterior means just behind the iris in the pars plane or pars plicator region, there is a very small foreign body. I faced this problem once. Any particular approach means because that's a difficult site to approach. Means the thing is localization will be using a UBM if we can do that. Some people have in the earlier days have tried bone free X dental X rays also. So first is localization to identify where it is. Second is you know you may have to sacrifice the lens to. see it through the without any viewing system directly through the cornea from the microscope itself so in case you are not you can try the routine technique by depressing and saying if you if you don't find it you may have to sacrifice the lens push it, push the uh, ciliary body area with a either a uh, forceps or a, what do you call depressor and then see through the cornea without any viewing system that will help you uh, because i think there was some previous case there was some approach that this a very anterior foreign body we should approach from outside then going from inside now outside again it's an issue because yeah, there is a lot of vascular tissue if you tissue. Can localize properly yeah. particularly anterior to the cilia uh, the ora serrata we can put a small incision over it and over the the rareth magnet over it yeah. so then then through that also you can remove it if you are able to localize properly yeah. then we can go transcleral and remove it that the um, accessing from the external route there is the uh, the the, the co choroid tissue to be dealt with sometimes the rem the rareth magnets are not as powerful uh, powerful to pull so you may want to use a electromagnet in these cases it has to pu pull through all these structures when you are doing it blindly especially uh, uh, what i meant is like you the magnet will hold on to it it's not to like bring it out through the tissue so you hold on to it then dissect it gently with uh, with a side entry knife then so that like it comes out so will give you an indication where it is so we're putting the thing it over it will give you an indication so you can remove it quite safely transcleally also thanks dr rajesh can i request dr uh, dr gopal to uh, deliver his uh, next lecture which will be on retinal attachment what's so different than handing traumatic retinal attachment traumatic retinal attachment is a totally different ball game so which dr gopal is going to tell us now I would like to thank Dr. Mahesh for including me in this uh, very interesting uh, instruction course. So I have a little bit of leeway in the way I present my uh, talk because 
it's on what is difficult. So it need not go in a, in a story as a sequence. But I'll try to make it into a story as a sequence. But it may be going haphazardly and I may end abruptly. That doesn't matter because I'm only trying to talk about what is difficult and not what is easy, at least from my perspective. So I think when we talk about a traumatic retinal detachment, we're talking about the issues in the eye that influence our decision-making process as to how we are going to approach the treatment. So these could be anatomical issues right at the time of injury and immediately after the injury. And these are the amount of corneal damage, the amount of integrity of the eyeball, the presence of collateral detachment, which is serous or hemorrhagic or a combination, mixture of the vitreous with the blood, disruption of the anti-segment, how bad is it, the iris is gone or iris is traumatized, then retinal architecture, how badly it is damaged, and then injury to the sensitive structures such as optic nerve and the macula. But as a vitreous surgeon, we are also interested in what are the anatomical issues when we decide to interfere. It's not always that the retinal surgeon comes into play at the time of repairing the injury, injured eyeball. But we need to come into play when we want to restore the eye to its integrity from the retinal and the functional point of view. And that is where I would call it as a definitive surgery, where you want to remove all optical impediments and reattach the retina so that the patient can see. So there again, the clarity of cornea should be judged so that we need to decide whether you want to do a combined surgery with a keratoplasty or just do a vitreous surgery. Again, we should understand that a mild haze in the cornea, which looks pretty bad preoperatively, on the table tends to clear very fast. Once you remove the inflammatory fibrin and restore the eye to the normal intraocular pressure, the cornea actually becomes clear enough to be able to manage without removing the cornea itself and do with, the endo with our uh, regular light pipe, etc. Lens status is important for you to again decide whether you are not you, you are or not going to remove the lens and whether you are not going to put an intraocular lens at the same time. Damage to the iris and ciliar body will cover a little later. And again, you need to judge where the wound is and where the retina is incarcerated, etc., so that you can decide where to make the sclerotomies, avoiding the areas of incarceration. The systemic issues that complicate the surgery or the presence of associated neurological or neurosurgical trauma, wherein the ocular management can become secondary and sometimes can be actually missed for a very long time. And the patient who has had actually neurosurgical trauma, people may discover that there's ocular trauma also with it much later. But where there is a good uh, interaction between neurosurgeons and ophthalmologists, you can always combine the ocular repair along with the neurosurgical intervention. The retinal detachment repair occurs maybe about 10 days, 15 days later, that is when you need to see whether the patient is fit to go through another GA or not, considering the neurosurgical trauma. And at this point of time, you always find that the ocular trauma probably was not properly managed, not even detected, because the patient was in a coma. Our initial globe restoration was not adequate. A very slipshod repair of the eyelids was done, and a conjunctival repair was done, but not a good explorative repair of the scleral wound. And a different surgery could have been delayed for such a long time that so much intraocular fibrosis that distorts the retina and makes your surgery extremely difficult. There could also be an orbital and adnexal trauma, which could also make the eyelid cover very difficult. That is, you do a good job of the eyeball, but you're not able to give a good eyelid cover to it. So that's where your oculoplastic surgeon's help is important. There are other issues. There could be bilateral injuries, which are not uncommon. And often this involves younger age group, and there are emotional issues and very high expectations from the patient's side. There are obviously medical legal issues as well. So it's very important that we put it in the correct perspective without upsetting them too much, but making our point clear that we do not know the outcome finally, and multiple surgeries may be required, at the end of which we may still end up with no proper vision. There are issues related to a closed globe trauma with a detachment, wherein the detachments are more chronic in nature, related to the retinal dialysis in the milieu of a vitreous which is not as yet detached which is the reason why you get late onset detachment, not early onset. Having said that, I can share with you two cases where the patient had an injury and within hours the patient came to us with a dialysis, looked like what looked like a dialysis or a tear, and a massive detachment, a huge bullous detachment. So the first impression is that this is a giant retinal tear with a detachment. But when I looked at it very carefully, I was not convinced that the vitreous is detached. And what I did was actually indented the eye at that point in the outpatient clinic and to my surprise, actually, the vitreous blob came into the vitreous cavity and the retina went back. So what happened was that due to the violence or the trauma, 
the vitreous is propelled into the supra supra subretinal space by the injury. The vitreous gel, not liquid vitreous, and hence what you have is an acute detachment of retina because the vitreous gel has gone in. Even just keeping the patient position or giving him a rest for a day or two, the vitreous gel actually migrates back into the vitreous cavity, and the retina goes back, allowing you to just do a laser without any surgery because the retina is not detached with fluid underneath. But dialysis, as I said, can be missed in the backdrop of a choroidal atrophy caused by the trauma. And you find very often that these are patients where the ophthalmologist has seen but has not detected the dialysis which is hidden in the backdrop of a choroidal atrophy. What all it was need, needed was just laser photocoagulation, but by missing it, you end up in having a detachment much later. And very often trauma could be forgotten and a detachment due to dialysis may not be appropriated to a trauma. And you should also not forget that these are eyes which is there is angle decision glaucoma, very often masked or camouflaged because of the presence of a detached retina. And the day you reattach the retina, the pressure shoots up because now the angle closure acts, comes into play. Or if a patient comes to you with a detached retina and a glaucoma already existing, the management becomes difficult you know 100% sure that the pressure scoop will go up even further once you reattach the retina. So it makes sense to do a glaucoma surgery as well along with the retinal reattachment surgery. With an open globe injury, we are dealing with a different set of complications. The need to sacrifice the lens, the retinal incarceration anteriorly in the anterior wound, a posterior incarceration of the retina at the site of the globe perforation, uh, early and very severe PVR because of admixture of the vitreous with blood and the cutting of the choroid and the sclera. Subretinal blood which could be variable in its extent and subretinal gliosis which could be as thin bands all the way to thick sheets which cover the entire subretinal surface. And these thick sheets can actually be not obvious until you actually open, remove the preretinal membrane, then you find the retina is very stiff not because of intraretinal gliosis but there is actually a subretinal sheet of membrane. Definitive surgery usually is planned about 7 to 15 days after the primary repair. We tend to give steroids preoperatively to make it, uh, make the eye quiet, the inflammation less, choroid less suffused, less edematous, and hence the eye probably can have less risk of recurrent PVR after surgery. The status of the retina is very often not evident preoperatively, and you make your decisions intraoperatively based upon each step follows the other. So you, tell, you don't tell the patient whether the retina is detached or not. You're going to decide on the table. The first step, of course, is to assess the cardinal clarity and the need for a combined PK. If it is not required, you go ahead. You may, you may like to play it as an encirclage in some cases, but where you think you may end up with a 30 degree retinectomy, there's absolutely no need for you to unnecessarily extend the pre-surgical uh, steps by placing an encirclage. You drain the supracoroidal blood first so that you, uh, your infusion cannula can be placed properly and uh, the amount of drainage would depend upon your assessment intraoperative, preoperatively as to where the supracoroidal blood is maximal and you form the anterior chamber, I mean form the vitreous cavity by injecting uh, saline through the anterior chamber. Because very often the lens is already traumatized, it's very easy for the fluid to be injected through the limbus. And once enough blood is removed, then you place the infusion cannula, assuring yourself of its location. You should understand that despite draining the supracoroidal blood and supracoroidal fluid, Still the choroid is probably partly detached and the infusion cannula tends to still slip into supracoroidal space. So there is also difficulty in introducing instruments, not just the infusion cannula but other instruments as well. And the infusion, the instruments can actually push the ciliary body ahead of them and you need to repeatedly push them back into the intravitreous space ac across the ciliary body. This anterior loop traction which is occurring in the retinal periphery because the retina is pulled anteriorly into a corneoscleral wound. And this again makes your instruments go through the retina into subretinal space. And very often a retinectomy is required even at the beginning of the surgery to enable a proper vitreous surgery. This is just a video which shows the retinal, uh, the vision canal not being able to enter the vitreous cavity wherein you in, in enter the MVR blade at the opposite quadrant and then cut over the inf indentation caused by the infusion cannula. And once the infusion cannula is inside, you can proceed with surgery normally. But again, having said that, during surgery, you must be conscious of the fact that this can tilt on either side, and the tilt can allow the tip to slip again into supracoroidal space. So you should make sure that the cannula is never tilted. 
and in the era of the uh, 23 gauge or 25 gauge cannulas, you don't fix the cannula. The cannula can slowly slip out of the eyeball, and then suddenly you'll find a supracoral detachment taking place. The choice of sclerotomy site is important. You avoid the scleral scars for obvious reasons, because the retina could actually be incarcerated in those wounds. You avoid previous sclerotomy sites because it, they can enlarge and merge into one large hole which can keep on leaking, keeping pro profuse hypotony. And a 23 gauge or 25 gauge is obviously better than 20 gauge because these trocar canal systems don't allow the sclera to enlarge. You can choose odd locations instead of the usual traditional locations in these cases because of obvious reasons. You can have a cannula placed inferior nasally or even at 12 o'clock and even all three sclerotomies placed superiorly so that you can manage the, uh, the case much better. The vitrectomy is thorough and a vitreous shaving is a must in all the cases of traumatic retinal detachments. And this vitreous shaving need not necessarily mean a sacrifice of the lens has been shown elegantly by Dr. Mahesh yesterday in one of his presentations of fake uh, peripheral vitreous debulking where you can nicely indent the eye and do a peripheral vitreous shaving without needing to sacrifice the lens in all cases. But where necessary, don't hesitate to sacrifice the lens. Our aims are much better, much more than just retaining the lens in these eyes. There's a special attention required for the vitreous in the wound. It has to be very carefully, deliberately observed and removed. And you should also observe that the vitreous can be adherent to the posterior surface of the iris without being in the wound. And that causes as much traction on the peripheral retina as even a vitreous in the wound. And this also has to be peeled away from the posterior surface iris. This is because of the violence of the trauma the vitreous is propelled against the iris and it gets stuck to the iris surface. You should manage the uveal tissue by suturing a cyclodialysis cleft at the same time and repair the iridodialysis at the same time and reconstructing the pupil. Reconstructing the pupil goes a long way, especially in silicon oil filled eyes, where you don't want the oil to migrate into the AC easily. Now, this is a case of uh, cyclodialysis cleft, which is being repaired at the same time as a vitreoretinal surgery. And the cyclodialysis cleft is actually is, is extending from here all the way up to here. And uh, we are using the, just a mechanical kind of suture technique because you're already inside the eye, which is already removed. It's not difficult to just suture the cyclodiasis cleft to uh, the scleral spur or scleral wall. Roughly about one to 1.5 millimeter from the limbus, you make the scleral cut. It's a groove actually I made. And you come out through the limbus and again reverse the needle and go back in through the same track. And then use a 27 gauge needle to take it out next to the point of entry. This is where you can actually see the cyclodialysis. You see, the ciliary body is actually here. And hence, I'm not able to penetrate with the needle, so I want to use it uh, to support the ciliary body while you penetrate the uh, needle actually through the fine needle of the 10 zero proline. And then you bring it out and tighten it across. So the same thing it can be done in multiple locations depending upon the extent of cyclodialysis. So reattaching the, the ciliary body at the same time is very crucial. Number one, it makes your further surgery easy because your instruments can go through the ciliary body without pushing it in front of them throughout the surgical step. And it also makes it easy for you uh, for, for the fact that the patient may not have cyclodialysis cleft related hypotony postoperatively. This is the second step, second suture which is being placed to suture the cyclodialysis cleft. So very often as vitreoretinal surgeons, you are you're concentrating on the posterior segment and you ignore the fact that this is equally important. Then cleaning the retina, differentiating between altered blood and retina is very important and it's not easy, mind you, especially within, in the milieu of a hazy media, you can always mistake an altered blood as retina and vice versa. You may spend a lot of time trying to carefully dissect a altered blood and actually go through an altered uh, retina, not knowing that you're actually cutting through the retina. So you clean the retina, 23 gauge instruments are better than 20 gauge. Uh, Bimanual surgeries may be needed for extensive pre-retinal membrane dissection, as well as for removal of subretinal bands. As I said, don't hesitate to make large peripheral retinotomies because what is clinically visible as a fine band actually is actually thick sheet with relative condensation locally, which is making it visible. So once you remove the band, you can actually see it's extending as a big sheet subretinally, and removing all the sheets is important in fixing the retina. The mantra is clean, clean, and clean. Retinotomies are required for removal of subretinal, blood, subretinal bands and for reattaching the retina. And as you can see in this case, the, the way the vitreous is going posteriorly tells you where the retina is incarcerated. I'll jump a little bit. So this is the peripheral base excision and the retinotomy being done, retinectomy being done all along the, uh, all around the, the, the retinal incarceration site. 
So difficulty due to compromise visualization, usually combined with the PK or due to endoscopic vitrectomy and so on and so forth. There is no end to the number of difficulties that we can face and we can expound and we can explain, but I guess the time is a limit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions, Dr. Popper? Yes, sir. There's one question there after that, sir. Sir, uh, as you are talking about that uh, retinal detachment post-trauma along with high IOP, some of the cases we face that it looks very easily operable as a scleral buckle, but the pressure is very high pre-op and we expect high IOP post-op and we may need glaucoma surgery I also. think that mic is not working. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, as cases of high IOP along with retinal detachment and the retina looks No, what is the difficulty in combining a scleral buckle with a, say, a trabeculectomy? I have no problem so in doing uh, that. Suppose we have dissected the conjunctiva all around, then I go Still it works, still it works, still it No, no, you see, there are two ways you can do a scleral buckle. You can leave the glaucoma surgeon's field untouched. Leave, say, about two or three clock hours and go around it, leave a large conjunctival rim and then go around the limbus and the rest of the quadrants. So the glaucoma surgeon does the trabeculectomy, then you, they su you suture the conjunctiva away from the site of trabeculectomy all around. So that works pretty well. And I have done combined surgery many times. And so combining with the trabeculectomy is not a problem, even in scleral buckle, where you have to open all around. Just because of that, you don't have to go in and do a vitrectomy because you want to, to spare the conjunctiva for the conjunctiva. For the glaucoma. So you can spare the conjunctiva even during a buckle. Can I add a point? Sir? In this case, we had a case where like this, during the process of scleral buckling, we left the RD plate inside, RD implant. And the tube was not communicated into the eye. It was just kept in the subconscious space under a scleral graft. So he said, uh, the glaucoma surgeon said, in, 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 case, when we, in case you feel that the IOP is not getting down with the medication later on, we'll just take the tip from the subconscious space and then put it into the uh, anterior chamber. Sir, I didn't get you. Uh, you can do U UBM pre op, but actually on the table you can see. You can see actually when the instruments are going in, you know how much is the dialysis. And it's not that we, are, we have to suture it point to point. When you, when, when you approximate it, depending upon the extent of dialysis, two or three sutures, when you approximate it, it gets it stays in scleral spur. Thank you. Now I call upon uh, Mahesh sir to uh, give his lecture on traumatic endophthalmitis. Thank you. Can you hear me? Check. Yeah. So traumatic endophthalmitis is not uh, akin to post-traumatic endophthalmitis. Let's see what is different in the first slide itself. For one, the risk is pretty high. So open globe injuries run a risk of nearly one in hundred risk of endophthalmitis. And there are some risk factors, one of them being intraocular foreign body. Depending on which paper you see, the risk runs from 1.3% to 60% of patients with intraocular foreign body have associated endophthalmitis. Eyes without intraocular foreign body, the risk comes up nearly half of it. And whatever we do, post-traumatic endophthalmitis, the outcome has been pretty poor. And there's a recent paper on uh, the pre-teens or teens with end of the post-traumatic endophthalmitis. Only about 30% of the patients have had, like, had ambulatory vision at the end of it. That's pretty poor results. Another key is post-traumatic endophthalmitis prompt treatment. In post-operative uh, post endophthalmitis, you have some time to wait. But post-traumatic, it's better that like, it has intervened as early as possible. Associated with favorable outcome, once again, the same paper showed that early vitrectomy, there is 27 times better chance of patient regaining some useful vision. Let's look at the risk factors for post-traumatic endophthalmitis, delayed wound closure. More than 24 hours is a definite indication, definite risk factor for post-traumatic endophthalmitis. So any wound we see, best is to close it. Best is to make sure that we close it as early as possible and not beyond 24 hours. Presence of an intraocular foreign body and the location of the contamination, soil or organic contamination is the risk factor for endophthalmitis. Other things which you want to look for in the eye are lens rupture, large wound size, and if the vitreous has prolapsed through the open gloop, th these are risk factors for endophthalmitis. 
clinical future, this is the difficult part because patient already has had an injury and there is corneal edema, there is a wound there, patient is in pain, so you are unable to assess if the patient is, if the pain is because of an associated endophthalmitis or because of trauma itself. Presence of hypopion, yes, it would make us think that there is an associated endophthalmitis, though a phaco anaphylactic VHS patient can also have an hypopion, but presence of hypopion, let us not assume that it's anything else other than endophthalmitis and treat it as endophthalmitis. Other signs of endophthalmitis like lid edema, corneal edema, the uh, like uh, infection in the wound site and purulent material would make us think that the patient has endophthalmitis. Subtle signs when we are able to see inside the eye are vitritis, peripheral bitis and retinitis. One of the images I think Dr. Saranan or uh, Rajesh showed, which showed peripheral bitis. So in a post-traumatic situation, we are looking at looking inside the eye and we see peripheral bitis or retinitis. That's a sign of endophthalmitis, not uh, not a, just a simple perivasculitis. Intraocular foreign body, all intraocular foreign body uh, eyes, we have to assume that it has got an endophthalmitis unless proven otherwise. So let's treat them as patients having endophthalmitis. Fungal endophthalmitis may not have the same clinical features. They may present later, they may not have severe pain, but they may present very inseriously. Management, if there is a wound, it has to be immediately repaired. And in contrast to postoperative endophthalmitis, here this plays a big role. So systemic anti antibiotics and antifungals are something which we uh, promptly initiate. And if possible, we have to remove the intraocular foreign body as early as possible. So this decreases the further pro propagation of the infection and also brings the infection under control and also better chance of eye survival. If there is no intraocular foreign body, once again, do we do an early vitrectomy or not? There is no literature, literature support to do an early vitrectomy. But post-traumatic eyes with endophthalmitis, better to intervene early because that is associated with a probably a little better uh, prognosis, vision prognosis. So role of intravital antibiotics is there, but that's not the primary treatment in managing a post-traumatic endophthalmitis. So let's look at the organisms which are associated with post-traumatic endophthalmitis. Around 50% are the gram-positive ones, staph, strep, bacillus, enterococcus. Pediatric, the, it kind of, there's a little reversal. Strep comes most, uh, most often as compared to staph and bacillus. Gram-negative, around 15% are pseudomonas. What is, again, different is post-traumatic situations, you can find a polymicrobial, uh, like, infection. So you can have a fungus plus a bacteria or multiple bacteria. Fungus, again, candida, fusarium, aspergillus are the organisms which are associated with post-traumatic endophthalmitis. So we start off right away with a systemic antibiotic or an antifungal. If it is a soil-contaminated wound or in the rural setting the injury has happened, then we start off with an antifungal, otherwise a systemic antibiotic. So what are the recommended systemic antibiotics? Vancomycin 1 gram BD, septazidine, or septazidine plus uh, amikacin is what we routinely give, but vancomycin is a good coverage. Fluoroquinolones can be given orally. Amoxifloxin, gatifloxin, gatifloxin we don't give uh, orally nowadays, it's not available because it causes uh, hypoglycemia. So ciprofloxin, norfloxin are the older groups, moxifloxin, these are given, orally can be given because they do enter into the eye even in the absence of an inflammation adequately. So this is something which can be at least a floro oral fluoroquinolone can be started. If you're suspecting a bacillus or anaerobic bacteria, vancomycin, the, instead of septazidine, we give clindamycin, amikacin, and gentamicin. Gentamicin, the, these are the three drugs which can be given. Antifungal, oriconazole, fluconazole, oral tablets can be given at 200 milligram uh, BD. And of course, we start the patients on topical fortified antibiotics covering the gram positive and gram negative. And moxifloxin is a good uh, uh, agent which can be used as well. In the traumatic situations, gas gangrene can also be seen in select situations. The organism is clostridium. So here, the antibiotics which we use are piptas, benzyl, pencil, and clindamycin, or metronidazole. And intravital piptas, clindamycin, vancomycin, septazidine are the ones which can be used if you're suspecting a gas, gas gangrene. And of course, we have to look at the tetanus uh, status of the patient as well. Clinical signs of clostridium, they are, these patients present with a very rapid onset with severe pain. It's particularly rare, but then like if a patient presents post-traumatic in, in a clinical appearance like this, we need to suspect this. Brawny swelling of the eyelid, early increase in IOP, and coffee-colored hypopion. This is something is, which is important, and gas bubbles which can be picked up by clinical examination or on ultrasonography or on imaging, and rapidly they become no light perception. And this is one such child with the brawny edema, and you can see the gas on the CT scan here. So these eyes are uh, associated with very poor prognosis. They can go in for evisceration or, like, or uh, 
enucleation. You can see uh, trying to tap the eye. You can see the gas bubbles coming out through here. Though the, we, didn't, we were not able to tap any uh, liquid vitreous, which was brown color, but you can see the air coming out through this. <coughs> While it is easy to say that like we have to remove the foreign body at the earliest, it is not easy. So as you can see, the cornea is macerated, so we may not be able to see inside, or the wound may not be, it may not be possible to suture it uh, tight, so that like when we do the vitrectomy, it may leak, and the eye is suffused, so this increases the risk of an, in, uh, like uh, the intraoperative bleeding. Dr. Divyansh is our foreign body man, so this is one second of the Divyansh video. So as you can see, this patient had a PK, and subsequently, Dr. Divyansh went and cleared the anterior vitreous and found the foreign body inside. So you have to cut open and again remove this uh, plastic pellet, what you can see here. So while it is, it is imperative that we remove the foreign body at the earliest in a traumatic endophthalmatic sitting or in a post-trauma sitting, but then the, the issue is it's not possible all the time. So in this patient, despite the fact that the cornea was shattered and we have done a PK, despite which, we could miss that there's, there's a foreign body inside and go ahead with that. And whether we do a complete vitrectomy or a core vitrectomy is again a question. Like Dr. Dr. Gopal mentioned, there could be incarceration of the vitreous in the posterior uh, exit wound or in the penetrating wound, and which can be associated with the fibroscopic proliferation and attraction retinal detachment or retinal detachment. So doing a complete vitrectomy is preferable, but then it may once again not be optimal because the cornea is scarred and the corneal edema is there. So we are not able to see inside in the first place and the wounds may be leaking so that the globe is not formed adequately for us to do a complete thorough vitrectomy. So case to case, we have to see if it is possible to do a complete vitrectomy, then let's go ahead with a complete vitrectomy. If it is not possible in the, in the presence of an endophthalmitis, better do a core vitrectomy and see if you are able to remove the foreign body and then manage the patient then subsequently take up for managing the complications associated with it like a retinal attachment. Why is it important to remove a foreign body? I'll show you one clinical example. This uh, gentleman had an uh, injury and uh, the uh, operating initial operating surgeon tried, like, took the patient up for surgery and uh, did a vitrectomy and had a retinal attachment and did the surgery and cataract surgery, everything. But the patient continued to have poor vision and had some kind of a vague inflammation. And this was the fundus when you see here. What you see here is a vascularized granuloma. This is about, mind you, this is about eight months after the primary surgery and primary wound repair. So we went ahead and see what, like Dr. Gopal mentioned, we disinserted the muscle and uh, explode outside. See what happens, that's pus. That's pus coming about eight months after the initial trauma where the foreign body went inside. So foreign body, as long as it's there, it's associated with this nidus of an infection. So unless, until we remove the foreign body, this nidus or the infection is unlikely to die down. So in a post-traumatic situation, if we continue to have a repeated inflammation, let's rule out a foreign body again. It could be an organic foreign body. We have to go back and look for it and remove it. So the other side. So it's not possible to do a vitrectomy because the cornea is so bad and you don't have a corneal surgeon who can remove and put a keratoprosthesis or it's so shattered we are not able to do, what do we do? So we should do, so if you're not able to remove the foreign body or if you're not able to, the eye condition does not allow a vitrectomy, what do we do? At least a vitreous tap and intravital antibiotics are to be given. So what are the intravital antibiotics? Same what we use in the post-operative setting. Piptas is something which we can use in, in lieu of uh, the septazidine. And if it is bacillus, then replace it with gentamicin, amikacin, or clindamycin. Organic or soil contamination where we suspect that it could be a fungal endophthalmitis, oriconos or amphobia are something which can be used intravitreally. So Dr. Gopal spoke to us about how difficult it is to do retinal attachment surgery. The presence of retinal attachment or intraoperative break is a, is a poor risk factor in eyes associated with post-traumatic endophthalmitis because these eyes inevitably land up with uh, Tysis or very poor vision. What is the problem is the, the, the vitreous which is left behind. Already a post-traumatic eye, you can see the viroscopic proliferation. And here we are not able to remove the vitreous and the inflammation associated with the endophthalmitis acts as an accelerated scarring response. So what I'm doing is to do a retinectomy peripherally to re release the retina from the peripheral scar tissue, which I will show you pretty soon. You can see the scar tissue. 
You can see this thick band of scar tissue which is formed all around 360 degrees in the ciliary body. This is the reason these eyes will go in for hypotony. We have tried removing this umpteen times in multiple ways. We have dissected it all through from the ciliary body and put a large limbal section and removed it through that. It is very difficult to cut with the cutter. Despite all that, this scar tissue is something which we cannot stop from happening, particularly in the pediatric group. So that's why if the patient has an RD intraoperatively, intraoperatively you develops an RD or already has an RD, along with an endophthalmitis, they are associated with a poorer prognosis. So what do we do if we see an open globe injury but the patient has not developed an endophthalmitis? So as I mentioned earlier, we start the patient on prophylactic IV and oral antibiotics. Intravitreal antibiotics we don't have to routinely give unless we look for an eye with an intraocular foreign body but has not yet developed endophthalmitis and we are not able to remove the foreign body. So patient has had an IOFP but we are not able to remove it right away and has not developed endophthalmitis. So we can give intravitreal antibiotics hoping that we should be able to remove it at the earliest in the next week or so. Other risk factors wherein we may have to concern intravitreal antibiotics are delayed wound closure, contaminated wound, and rural trauma. So to summarize, post-traumatic endophthalmitis is different from managing a post-op endophthalmitis. Prompt manage with management with systemic antibiotic and antifungals is essential. Early vitrectomy with IOF pill wherever it's possible, intravitreal antibiotic in select situations. But despite all said and done, these eyes are associated with the guarded anatomical visual prognosis. Thank you. Any additional so points? Sir, one, one point I wanted to make that uh, is removal of a foreign body is an emergency because you don't want endophthalmitis to occur. But in the milieu of an eye with already endophthalmitis present with a foreign body, if removal of foreign body is going to be more traumatic to the retina and difficult for you to remove, there's no harm in clearing the vitreous, controlling the infection, and then going back again and removing the foreign body in a more controlled way. Because the infection has already occurred. You know, it's not that the, you're trying to uh, avoid infection. How often will you repeat your intravitreal injections? Uh, is it any different from post-operative to traumatic? It depends on what the organism is naturally. So if it is fungal, we have had a situation where we give almost every day different agent that also we have given. But, but if it is arterial, usually we give it once in 48 hours. Once in 48 hours as usual. But otherwise, like uh, if it is the organism is different and not responding, we give it almost every day also. Uh, sir, in trauma cases, like, shouldn't we give uh, intravitreal vanco and tezac in all trauma cases if they come within three, four hours so that we can prevent it rather than have it and then treat it? That's what I mentioned. It's right now the literature or the experience is not supportive of everything. Right now the recommendation is if you're suspecting high chance of a contamination okay. or if you're suspecting a foreign body which you're not able to remove, then you can give an intravitreal. Otherwise, there's no need to give an intravitreal in every patient because it's not easy to give because the wound may be open somewhere and the drug may not remain inside also. And if we give like one drug in the AC and the other in the vitreous, suppose we are not clear whether, you know, the it is hypotenuse, so we are not very clear as to how we are uh, giving it in the vitreous cavity or not. So I'm, no, I'm not given uh, in the anterior chamber specifically, but I guess like based on case to case basis, you can decide on it. So what, like what is the that for not for every trauma you need to give intravitreal antibiotics, it's a prophylactic. Only when there's a strong suspicion that you got that point, I guess. Some, somehow, in my experience, I do around 5-10 traumas in a month. So what I felt is that whenever I, never, I did not give, that patient developed and then you again have to take up the patient. So now my staff is ready with the injection that you have to put it because we don't want him to come again. And that has worked for last few years. It has worked wonders for me. There are no further uh, questions. I think it's we are right on the dot of time. And thank you very much uh, for uh, being part of this instruction course. I thank all my uh, co-instructors as well. Thank you.